Good morning, Nuggets. Welcome to the Elements of Fiction series. And our first lesson in this series is plot. The ultimate goal of this series is to review your literary terms so that you can analyze a work of literature in depth and do an amazing job on your SOLs and your SATs. So this is a flipped lesson, meaning you do the lesson at home by taking notes. There is a handout with a list of all the important terms along with spaces for you to write your notes uh, available on the Fusion page. So you can print that out or if you like, you can just take notes on paper, especially if you need a little more room, that's fine. Just make sure that you don't forget to write a notes summary at the end where you sum up what you learned from the lesson in three to five sentences, reflect on what you know and what you still have questions about. So. Let's get started talking about plot. First, what is a plot? When we talk about plot in English class, we are going to define it as a series of related events. It is the story. You'll notice the word related is highlighted because if you just have an, a series of random events, but they don't go anywhere, then you don't really have a plot. For example, if I said, I bought new shoes, I went trick-or-treating, I met someone new, I want to go see this movie. Those are totally disjointed. They don't connect at all, which is why we have the picture of a chain here in the middle. So in a story, the events connect and lead uh, one into the other. So that's the way that you need to think of plot. What makes the plot move forward is conflict. Hence, we have this person fueling up with their car. A story fuels up with conflicts, and those conflicts are struggles. And there are two main categories of conflict. We have external conflict. Now, you should know from your roots that E or EX, you know what that root means, right? What's it mean? Yes, you're right. It means outside or out or forth. So an external conflict is an outside conflict. And there are many different variations of outside conflicts. You could have one character versus another character. You could have a character versus a group of characters or even a character versus an entire society. If you think of Hunger Games and Divergent, those are two classic examples that are pretty current. Uh, you could have a character versus nature. So if you are stuck in the rain or in a thunderstorm, you are in conflict with the weather. That's one example. And last but not least, uh, it, the last one, character versus an idea, this can sometimes be a little bit complicated because you're trying to wrap your head around uh, challenging a belief or a worldview. So all of those are outside of the main character. They're an outside force, so those are external. Internal conflict, on the other hand, is always going to take place within a character. Uh, it, it's just self-contained and it has to do with the character's mind or their heart. So when you see characters in internal conflict, they're usually having to either make a decision or you'll see them wrestling uh, with different competing or warring emotions where they're, they're struggling with their feelings. We'll talk more about protagonists and antagonists uh, on another slide. But for now, you should know that the main conflict in a story usually revolves around the protagonist versus the antagonist. Now, we tend to think of that as being the good guy versus the bad guy, but really, it's not that simple. When we use these terms, a protagonist is just the main character, and an antagonist is just an opposing force. Notice it doesn't say the word character. An antagonist does not necessarily have to be a a character or a person. It could be something like, for example, the weather, like a hurricane that someone is battling against. So these are the two main types of conflict, external and internal. When we look at stories and we analyze them, sometimes it's useful to look at models of patterns that are common across stories. And one very common pattern that I'm sure that you've learned about before is Freytag's pyramid. Uh, this is more commonly known as a plot diagram. And the plot diagram has five main pieces or components to it. And we'll look at each of these in turn. But this visual 
just overviews them. So you'll notice your story will start with exposition and characters and the setting and the basic situation will be introduced. Then you'll have the rising action. So the conflict will be introduced and there'll be a series of complications that build suspense leading up to the climax, which is the most exciting part of the story. It's also where we find out how the main conflict will end. It's kind of like standing up at the top of a hill and you can now see what's on the other side. That's the way a climax works in a story. After the climax, uh, the falling action resolution are very brief. Falling action is where the author is going to tie up loose ends and try and answer any remaining questions or tie up loose threads in the story. And then of course the resolution is the very end and hopefully in most cases the story should leave you, the reader, feeling satisfied and like you got something out of it. It doesn't always happen. Some resolutions are better than others, but that's the ultimate goal. Remember, this is a pattern that doesn't apply perfectly to every single story, but it is useful because so many stories do proceed in basically the same way. Let's break down Freytag's pyramid or the plot diagram piece by piece and really zoom in and zero in on these definitions. So first piece of the pyramid is the exposition. This is the opening of the story. It sets the scene for everything else that's going to follow. So it will introduce the most important characters, usually. It'll describe the setting, so it will tell you where it's taking place, what historical era, what time of day, uh, what culture, uh, what the weather is like. All those things are part of your setting. And last but not least, it will tell you the basic situation. So for example, in Most Dangerous Game, we learn that the main characters are uh, Rainsford, and we know that he is a big game hunter headed on a hunting trip to Rio in Brazil, and that the ship is currently in the Caribbean, and that the weather is very still, it's very dark, it's at night, and it's very hot, humid, which all creates this sort of foreboding atmosphere of impending doom. So that's your exposition. Your rising action will begin when conflicts are introduced. And conflicts are important because they build suspense and they heighten that edge of your seat feeling. So complications. There will always be one main conflict in a story, but as you know from reading your novels for first quarter, there are a lot of other conflicts as well. These lesser conflicts are often referred to as complications. There are additional obstacles that the character has to overcome as they're also trying to deal with the main conflict. Now sometimes the complications relate directly to the main conflict, sometimes they don't. Um, especially in novels or longer works of fiction, the complications are often not 100% related to the main conflict. You might have several um, main conflicts going on. Complications are important because they really build that edge of your seat feeling, which we call suspense. It's the force that propels you forward in the book, or it's the force that makes you sit there and keep watching if you're watching a movie. And the reason why it does that is you need to know what will happen next. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth uh, later in the lesson. But rising action is rising because it's building suspense. Complications can take a lot of different forms, and this slide should look somewhat familiar to the internal and external conflict slide that we talked about. Uh, this basically gives you a visual just to review um, the different types of conflict that can happen. So out of all these conflicts, all of them are external or outside conflicts, except for this one, man versus himself is an internal conflict. Remember, man versus himself is when you're struggling with emotions or if you are struggling to make a difficult choice or decision. Then, of course, we have man versus man, okay, two different characters who definitely do not agree. This is an illustration from one of my favorite comics, Calvin and Hobbes. You can have a man versus an idea. So, uh, this is an example of a belief. So you see some protesters here believe in keeping abortion legal, while other protesters do not and feel it's wrong. So man versus idea could be a complication. Man versus society, uh, again, this is on such a broad scale, it can sometimes be 
um, difficult to think about. But I feel like this picture from Tiananmen Square, uh, June 5th, 1989, shows one man's bravery uh, against um, his, his government and his military, and he's taking a stand um, for what he believes is right for his society. And last but not least, man versus nature. This could be anything from a character being attacked by a dog to being caught in a flood as this individual is here. So remember, there are lots of different ways that complications can arise. In the rising action, though, there will be a main conflict, and the main conflict will deal directly with the protagonist and the antagonist. So the main character in the story is the protagonist. Now, th it's possible to have more than one protagonist, especially if you're reading a novel. But in short stories, it's usually typical to only have one. So, for example, Rainsford is not a perfect person, but he is our protagonist. He is our main character. Okay? And then the protagonist will always be dealing with an antagonist. Now, the thing to remember about an antagonist, and meaning against, of course, the main person or thing that creates a problem for the protagonist. The antagonist does not have to be a person. It does not have to be a character per se. Although my illustrations here, we have Simba versus Scar. Uh, that's a very classic example of a protagonist versus the antagonist. Of course, Scar causes lots of problems for Simba. So how do complications build suspense exactly? Let's zoom in on this. Complications build suspense because when complications happen, we naturally start to make predictions. We start making guesses based on the evidence in the story, and then we want to keep reading because we want to see if our predictions are right. That is how authors build suspense. So a review, you should know this as one of your six key reading strategies, prediction, that's making a guess or an inference based on evidence in the story, and then that builds suspense. So what do we make predictions um, on? What do we base them on? We base them on clues given to us by the author. And the term for those clues is foreshadowing. So foreshadowing, those are all the little hints that an author will drop in the story that kind of clue you in that something else is going to happen. And again, this is building suspense because you keep reading to see if you're right on the money. So for example, in The Most Dangerous Game, uh, we hear the sailors and Whitney's talking about how the sailors and the captain are freaked out by Ship Trap Island. Even the name is kind of ominous. Um, the hot, still weather, kind of that calm before the storm, also has this ominous flavor letting you know something is probably going to happen. That's not very good. Uh, another example foreshadowing in Most Dangerous Game is when Zeroff's d uh, physical appearance is described uh, with red lips and pointy teeth, it lets you know that he might be savage or dangerous in some way. So the rising action is usually the bulk of the story. Everything that comes after it is generally fairly brief and to the point. So after you have established what's going on in the exposition, you build up suspense in the rising action, Finally, you will reach a point where everything must come to a head, the pivotal moment in the story, and that is called the climax. The climax is the key and most important scene in the story. Um, it's typically one of the most exciting, but not always, because exciting is a matter of opinion, of course. Here's what you need to remember about climax so you don't miss it on the quiz. It is the moment in the story when we learn what the outcome of the main conflict will be. It is the turning point. It ends the main conflict, or we know how the main conflict is going to end. So for example, if the story is about survival, as Most Dangerous Game was, the moment in the story when you know whether the main character is going to live or die, that would be the climax, okay? Um, it's described in this picture as the tipping point. And just think of yourself, running up the side of a hill. So you run up the hill until you get to the very top, if it's a steep hill, you cannot see what's on the other side. When you reach the climax in the story, now you can see what's on the, quote, other side of the hill, meaning you can see where the rest of the story is headed, where it's going to end up with the resolution, how everything is going to 
finally end. So that's why the climax is at the peak of the pyramid. After we've reached the climax, things typically wind down very quickly because there's no longer really any suspense. So you'll find that the following action and the resolution will be the shortest parts of the story. And in fact, many stories have very little falling action or a very brief resolution or very little resolution. And how much falling action or resolution there is is really going to determine how satisfied the reader is with the story. So let's talk about falling action. The falling action occurs immediately after the climax, and it's where the author begins tying up the loose ends. They try to answer the reader's remaining questions. So you see in the illustration at the bottom, uh, the person is putting in their missing puzzle piece. Uh, this is where um, any minor plot points will be wrapped up before the very end of the story. Or at least you hope that the author does this, otherwise you end up being very frustrated in some cases, like this little cartoon. The final part of Freytag's pyramid, or the plot diagram, is called the resolution. Now, English is a wonderful language, and in your English classes, your teachers might refer to resolution in another way. They may also use the term denouement. Uh, it's French, it's not denouement, it's denouement. Um, and these two words are synonyms, so they're interchangeable, they mean exactly the same thing. And the resolution is the end of the story, and it brings everything to a close. At this point in the story, everything's answered, readers feel satisfied, and like they can close the book or walk away from the short story and get on with the rest of their lives. As we said, different authors approach resolution very differently. So some stories will be more satisfying at the end than others, and part of that is also a matter of opinion. Okay, so our five parts of the plot pyramid, again, are exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and our resolution. In addition to knowing the main parts of the plot diagram, we also need to understand that the plot diagram is based on the assumption that the story is proceeding in chronological order. Of course, not all plots follow this order but let's review what chronological order is. So chronological order is the time order in which events unfold. So you start with the first event that happened in time, and then you end with the last. So our illustrations at the bottom, anytime you give someone directions on how to do something, it's usually very important that they're in chronological order. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, finally you do this. Um, to the right, this timeline, so timelines that you look at in world history class is a good example of chronological order, and this, of course, is uh, chronological order of different gaming systems. Kind of fun. So chronological order, most stories are told this way, but not all, and I'm sure if you think of just even popular films or TV shows, a lot of them play around with time to make it more interesting, or to add more detail, or to build more suspense. So let's look at the two main ways that authors can mess around with time. The first is, of course, a flashback. This should be relatively easy to remember because it has the word back in it. Basically what the author will do is they will interrupt the flow of the current events in the story, and they will pause and present an episode from the past. It could be as a memory, um, it could be just literally jumping back. A classic example of this, and there are many of them, but in the movie Titanic, we have the elderly Rose telling about the experiences of the younger Rose. And throughout the film, we jump back and forth um, in time. So that is a flashback. Usually authors use, use flashback to explain character motivations, Sometimes they do it to build more suspense. Sometimes they do it just to let us know characters a little bit better or to help us better understand what's about to happen next in the story. Now, if we can go back in time, we also can go forward into time. So a flash forward is when you interrupt the flow of events by jumping ahead into the future. 
A good example of this, although I do not have it uh, on my screen, is the movie Finding Nemo. So we begin the movie Finding Nemo and we see the tragic circumstances uh, under which uh, Nemo loses uh, his, his mother. Um, and then we jump forward to the present day. Nemo is on his way to school and headed off with Dory. So we flashed forward. Usually authors will do that uh, to keep a story from being too long and to only highlight what is most important. Uh, another classic example of this is Simba. So Simba is a young cub and he leaves and then you'll remember magically after meeting Timon and Pumbaa, we see him walking through the jungle and he grows up in the space of like 30 seconds. So that's another example of flashing forward in time. So you start at one point and then you leap far ahead into the future. And that's it for plot. If you're wise, you will get on Quizlet later tonight and start studying some of these terms. That way, when you come to class, you'll be ready for the activity. See you then, McNuggets. Bye.